Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker, and this is Munich, a city emblematic of Germany's prosperity and small c conservatism. But right now, German politics looks anything but steady, stable, and predictable. Angela Merkel's new grand coalition with the Social Democrats is very fragile. And the biggest opposition party is the far right alternative for Deutschland. My guest today is the influential AFD MP, Peter Boehringer. So, how will his party try to exploit the weakness of Angela Merkel? Peter Boehringer, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you for having me. Let's start with a big picture of German politics today. In some ways, nothing much has changed. Here we are again facing uh, a grand coalition led by Angela Merkel with the Christian Democrats and the SBTD together. But actually, are things really quite different this time? Well, we're not even there. We don't have that coalition yet, but yes, I guess, well, yeah, I guess you're right. We're, we will have that pretty soon. Uh, and having said that, I would agree that it's no longer the same. Uh, we have now a coalition of official losers. Both the SPD and the CDU of Angela Merkel have lost uh, more than 15% at the general election last autumn. And in the meantime, they have lost even more. You could say they have lost more than 20% of the vote since 2013. So it is, it is, of course, a different situation, absolutely. What's your strategy in the AFD? Are you going to be spoilers looking for a fight or are you going to try to be constructive? Because you now are, in essence, the biggest opposition party. Oh, we are, but uh, fight is not... Uh, uh, an end in its own right, of course. Uh, so we're not fighting just for the sake of fighting. Uh, we're fighting for bringing Germany back on a legal track uh, where laws are not violated all the time, especially when it comes to the Euro uh, rescue and uh, the border controls and the immigration. And we're also trying to bring back a, a little more direct dem democracy, that is that the people uh, have a say um, in the Bundestag again, which they didn't have for a long time. Your, um, your bedfellows in Europe, I guess, are the National Front in France, uh, the Austrian Freedom Party, Geert Wilders' party in the Netherlands. Many people in your country and across this continent are extraordinarily worried about the power and influence you can now wield. Well, actually, we're latecomers in Germany. It is very late that Germany has ultimately come up with a central right uh, new party, uh, sticking to the uh, values and virtues that uh, were normal in Europe uh, up until the 1990s and 2000s. Well, they're uh, not right. Uh, you're, you're far right. Well, I've just listed your bedfellows. They're, they're all far right. Many people would say extremist parties. I, I, I would have to look into each and every one of them. And Gott Wilders is uh, diff completely different from Marine Le Pen and from the Austrian right. So uh, that's probably going too far now. But well, why, the way, the why, way why, I, in what way are you completely different? The way I see it is that uh, we, and I personally too, have not changed my political opinion in 20, 30, 40 years at all. I only stick to a world where the nation state was undisputedly the natural state of affairs, where uh, this was, nobody disputed that. No party, uh, we have a program, and I was a member of AFD's uh, program commission, uh, that the CDU had up until 2005, and even the SPD had in the 1990s. So we are not extremists. Uh, that was normal at the time. We didn't change. Society has changed, and especially the, the um, well, the, the medial perception. Of well, society. No, I'm not talking about media perceptions. I'm talking about perceptions of, of significant people. For example, let me quote you on Charlotte Knobloch, uh, who is a former president of the Council of German Jews. She describes your party, the AFD, as a destructive power which endangers democracy. Well, I don't know what crystal ball Mrs. Knobloch has, but uh, she cannot see in the future. She has no evidence uh, I guess she whatsoever. Judges you on she can. The words of, of what, whatsoever she can. Members. 
Well, you can always put individual words out of context. Uh, but I don't see it that way. Our program is not radical at all. It is uh, absolutely uh, bourgeois, I would say, in the positive sense of the word. Well, I suppose then we need to test you against some of the things that senior leadership figures in your party have said in the I recent past. I hope you past. put it into context. Well, let's see. Let's see. That's what usually is not that, being done. Now that you're <laughs> the main, biggest opposition party, let's see whether <laughs> the tone and style of the party is beginning to change. For example, Let's take one of your senior figures, Bjorn Hooker, a regional <laughs> he, He's always quoted, even though he's not a senior figure. Well, he is a senior no, figure. In his, in no, his land, in his region, no, he's, he's a senior a, figure. Well, he's one of 16 uh, regional figures. Yes. yes. Well, there you go. Mm. He and he's quoted all the time. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you, maybe then you know what I'm going to ask you, whether you now distance yourself from his comment when he described the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin as a monument of shame. And he suggested that Germany shouldn't have put it up and no other nation would have put it up. He put it like that. And uh, well, it's a memorial of shame. It's one of the worst uh, periods of German history. And uh, there's no, but you know what he meant. He meant it was a shame that it had been erected. It was a shame. Uh, I don't know what he meant. He said that uh, this was uh, no other country would put up a memorial for the worst period of their um, of its history. I wouldn't have put it that way, but that's what he meant. All right. A, a last one on this style. Mm -hmm. It's important, I think, to find out whether. Now that you are the biggest opposition party, your language is going to change. As a party, I'm going to quote to you uh, Stefan Brandner. Now, he's important because as an MP, he's now going to be chairman of the Judicial Committee. He referred some time ago to the Green Party as child molesters and cokeheads. He has been suspended frequently from his regional parliament when he was serving there because of his outrageous behaviour. Is it, do you think, wise to put him into a position such as committee chairman of the Judicial Committee? Well, it was not my decision. It was the decision of the so-called Ältestenrat, the elder uh, uh, council of the Bundestag. Uh, they put him in that position. Uh, nobody disagreed, not even the lefts and the greens themselves. <laughs> nobody disagreed. It was only at the election proper, at the uh, initial meeting the, uh, uh, of that committee uh, that he was disputed uh, for whatever reason. This is the first time this happened in 60 years in German history. Uh, same for me, uh, for no reason at all. Um, we have seen former Nazis in the 1950s heading those councils. We have seen former uh, communists from the SED uh, murderer party uh, in the 1990s. Nobody was ever disputed. And some people who got a few calls uh, in regional parliaments and even me, who, who did nothing at all basically, <laughs> were disputed just because we were AFD members. And let, is, let, let me put it this way. This is way. the treatment uh, AFD is uh, receiving well, all the time. Let me put it this way. Do you acknowledge that the party is going to have to change? And that part of that change is going to be different style, tone, and language. And maybe some members of the party who were senior figures in the past mm -hmm. will not be in the future. Yes, I would agree there, but that's normal with almost every party. Yes, we have to become more professional, uh, but ultimately you have to understand that uh, the tone and the brutality is, not, is only a reaction uh, from our side against the brutality of the ruling class. Uh, they oh, break no, the laws no. all the time, and it is uh, us who give the people who are really furious about developments in, in Germany, especially. But, but you can't a voice. say that And all sometimes, of your... uh, especially if you are a, a not yet parliamentary in a position, uh, which we had been up until uh, well 2014, um, no, you have to use a little stronger language. All opposition parties have done that in the past. Yes, but you can't. Uh, excuse some of the things said by I don't want to excuse in your party. everything. I'm sorry. I don't want to excuse everything. All right. Well, let's let's talk a little bit of substance. Let's talk about <laughs> immigration and integration policy in Germany today. And let me quote to you the words again of a very senior figure in your party, <laughs> Alexander Gauland, who got into an argument very recently with the the German Commissioner for Integration, Aidan Özgüz, who of course has Turkish ethnic roots. Now, Ms. Uzegus had said, and this was in a newspaper article, that a specifically German culture beyond the language is not identifiable. You're right. Yeah, to which Mr. Gowland said, this is what a German Turk says, let's invite her to Eichsfeld and tell her what specifically German culture is. And afterwards, she'll never come back and we will be able to dispose of her in Anatolia. Well, you would 
probably me as a German have to explain what Eichsfeld even means because I don't know what he meant by that. I, I think even though uh, I don't speak German, in the translation I get the tone <laughs> and I get the sense of what he's trying to say. I don't know. I don't Is that acceptable? I don't even know. To dispose called, of her. I don't even know a, a, a word called Eichsfeld. And well, is that acceptable that Mrs. Özoguz, who is you must really be aware of that, the integration minister of the government does not perceive or recognize a German culture. How can you integrate into something which does not exist? That's what she started out with. And this is a perfect example that our reaction is just, well, I, was, I would almost say adequate. She's from Hamburg. She's fully German. But she's obviously a very important, she doesn't feel like a, Hamburgian. She, well, as a, as, a, <laughs> as a citizen of Hamburg in Germany, she has a right to an opinion, doesn't she? She's actually a very important person. She's the Highly integration respected. minister. Judge her based on, her, you, on but, her office. But yeah? your, senior, not your, as leader, a, your leader is basically suggesting that we will dispose of her in Anatolia. That, a, a senior well, figure the, from the, the CDU, the Germ, the Nor, German, Norbert Rutgen, he said this The language, German word does not mean to, to well, get rid of her somehow. Well, uh, senior or, figures... Or not more than that. Senior figures least. on the conservative right, like Norbert Rutgen, said the language is disgusting disgusting and dehumanizing. Why won't you say that too? Well, I would say the policy of the coalition governments, including Mr. Rutgens, is disgustable and has been disgustable for decades now. So we are reacting and we're giving people a voice who are all disgusted of that policy. I do want to talk about economics, but, but just on <laughs> really? the specifics of immigration policy, <laughs> what we see today is that there has been a very significant number of people coming into Germany on those immigration flows from from the east. Uh, the numbers were extraordinary. We know that many more than one million came in that period after 2015. But in the last year, the figures suggest uh, 187,000 came in compared to 280,000 in 2016, far down from the peak in 2015. So it does appear that the policies adopted by Mrs. Merkel's government in the last year or two have very much reduced the inflow. Would you accept that? Well, it's a relative comparison. If you compare it with the levels of 2015, which were suicidal to, a, uh, to any society, we have abandoned our, we had abandoned our borders at the time. Just imagine, yeah? But I'm asking you now, in the current situation, where the government has changed policy and the numbers are right down, what would you do that is so very different from the Merkel government today? If you please do not inter interrupt me, I would could final finalize my sentence. She invited everybody in September 2nd, 2015, by basically officially saying we're abandoning our borders. Uh, our, poli our police, um, the head of the German police, um, wanted that order in writing. It was an executive order and no law was changed. Uh, but uh, we officially abandoned our border and this, of course, uh, this word spread in Africa and, and Arab, Arabia within minutes. So we would stop that. We would stop that invitation, of course, Mrs. Merkel never, never, ever but, did but that. Mrs. Stopped. Merkel, now it has not stopped. Absolutely not. Even the official, uh, the official number that the government itself admits to is 220,000, not counting uh, family, uh, families of those refugees. So we're talking about more than 500,000 people, illegal immigrants still. This is the current number. Uh, whatever you, numbers you have, they are not right. And uh, Mrs. Merkel has not stopped it. That's the reason why her polls are so falling dramatically. What, what, what do you do? You, you end Schengen for a start, do you? The free movement of people within the European uh, Union. And do you also put up uh, walls? Well, I'm, I'm no, not clear no, what it's the all, It's all about mass do. psychology. We will not have to do that. We would have to stop that invitation officially and seriously. And we would have to bring back even by force, a few of those illegal immigrants. And if you only did that with a thousand people seriously, which is not happening these days, uh, that word would also spread into Africa and into Arabia, and it would the, the, that mass uh, influx would stop immediately. To what extent is this about Muslims in particular? I noticed that you have a policy to ban uh, foreign funding in mosques in Germany to ban the burqa, I guess the, the full body veil. We're not the only ones, I guess. Uh, ban the Muslim call <laughs> to prayer in Germany, put all imams through very rigorous state vetting. I think it's fair to say that to many Muslim Germans, this feels like a, 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 some sort of war on their religion. Uh, well, you could argue who started that war as well. Uh, but. Yes, uh, I would Is say that the way you uh, see statistically 85% of uh, that immigration, that's just a fact, is Muslim and it's, it's mainly Sunnite Muslim. 
so yes, you could say it is also an Islamic problem in our point of view. But it's not only that. I mean, uh, abandoning its borders would even be uh, wrong uh, if only Scandinavians came uh, ended up into Germany. So it's always a, it's always a problem. Uh, so uh, and well, what what you've just elaborated or enumbered uh, is not totally true. We accept uh, the legal right to private confession, religious freedom if you want. That's Article 4 of our Constitution. We fully accept that. Nobody ever disputes that with AFD. The, uh, the individual Muslim, uh, Muslim has a right to pray, both in private and in public, um, but he has no right to put Sharia law above the secular law. And that's uh, what many, many Muslims unfortunately are doing, especially Muslim groups, and that we do not accept. Mr. Buringer, you, you have a background in economics and in business before you came into yes. politics. Are you comfortable that these days the AFD seems to uh, find its strongest support and indeed its, its main raison d'etre in anti-immigration policies rather than the more technocratic anti-eurozone stance that actually the party began with? Well, nobody can really say why we are being vote, uh, 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 why people vote for us. Uh, I think that at least 50% uh, of the voters uh, still vote for the uh, well, anti euro rescue reasons, which I stand for. And many uh, do not want to see many do not want to see Islamization. I believe with the uh, fight, fighting against Islamization is a fight for liberalism. Uh, Islam, especially the well, Islam of the uh, of the strong religious people, uh, Muslims are uh, is anti-liberal. It's against human rights. It's against uh, women's rights. Uh, this is a fight for, lib uh, for for freedom, actually. So uh, it do does not contradict in any way our fight for freedom, uh, which uh, we also have against the the Euro rescue and against the EU in total. Uh, I think this uh, you cannot sort that around and say this is a minor uh, group of our electorate, uh, and uh, well the whatever you call them, nationalists or chauvinists or patriots, are the majority of, of, our, of our voters. You, uh, you now have an important position in the German parliament. You chair the committee on the budget. Now, that, that gives you real power and influence. Uh, how are you going to use it? It is a moderative role. It is a <laughs> symbolic role if you want. Uh, I have to head a committee uh, where I only represent a minority. I will be overvoted <laughs> frequently in almost all budget decisions because... Well, the you're the chairman, majority. so to a certain extent the chairman, you, can, but, uh, you can shape the agenda and you can certainly have an influence. Oh, and I just wonder, again, it came back to my original question about how the AFD sees itself today mm -hmm. in, a, in a very fluid political situation. Will you push very hard on issues such as future Eurozone bailouts, the ambition that Germany and France appear to have mm -hmm. to go into a much deeper fiscal integration, will you be doing your utmost to block all of that? I would love to do that. Unfortunately, the bulk of the money that is taken into the hands of the European Union um, uh, to permanently rescue the euro every day with one to two billion does not appear on my very budget. It doesn't. It is not on, on the official German budget because this is money coming from the European Central Bank. This is guarantees uh, spoken or given by the European government, by the German government especially, but they are not automatically part of my budget. We're talking about sums here that exceed the huge budget I'm heading now. It's more than 320 billion a, a year and it doesn't even appear. This is one of the scandals uh, of, of this uh, budget because the money all comes from Europe. It is future um, tax money from European citizens, especially German citizens. I understand that, that the AFD uh, really, really doesn't like the way the Eurozone works and wishes that the Deutschmark could be restored to Germany. We have come but and you, gone there. But do, do you go further? I mean, do you actually want to get Germany out of the European Union? Do you look at Brexit and think, you know what, that is something that we want and need in Germany too? Well, I'm sympathetic towards the, the British who voted uh, for the Brexit, but well, the world did not go under uh, <laughs> in Britain just because you left or you're about to leave. Uh, so uh, Do you all, think the all, those, all those doomsday prof uh, pro prophecies that uh, the world would go under <laughs> if Britain left the euro did not come true, and I believe they will not come true. But having said that, uh, yes, 
Uh, Do you think the German public has any interest in leaving the European Union? I think they have if they knew the real situation, if they knew how much money, especially future tax money, is being spent on the Euro rescue. But what I keep saying, and this is important, mm. is that uh, wh whether AFD existed or not, the Euro would have a natural end of its lifetime. It is an unnatural currency, a, a currency that has to be rescued every day is no currency. It's just a contradictory contradiction in terms. It's a crash that will happen. It will happen in any case. And if we wait too long with that uh, inescapable decision, then, uh, then the euro can really become uh, a, a question of war and peace. I've just looked at some opinion polls which show that you in the AFD, having won just short of 13% in last September's election, now stand at 15% in the latest national polls. Do you see yourselves in the long term becoming, somehow becoming partners of a post-Merkel conservative party in Germany? Or do you see yourselves replacing the CDU, CSU? It, it, it is a question that is being uh, heavily discussed in our own party as well. Um, to date, nobody wants to do a coalition with us. We don't want to uh, do that with the other parties as well uh, because they follow that super nationalistic agenda, which do, we don't accept. Uh, they follow that uh, plant central economic uh, policy of the Eurozone, which we do not accept. And this includes the federal, uh, the liberal Democrats here in, in Germany. So to date, we cannot do a coalition with them. But things do change, and I think they will change quickly. AFD works uh, already today from the opposition lines uh, into the government lines. And uh, if uh, the leading class of those parties is being replaced, and it will happen pretty quickly, I guess, uh, well, then maybe we have a different situation. But these, uh, um, these, parties, Mrs. these Mrs. parties will have to become uh, to accept the, the very idea of the nation state again, which they have abandoned. And this the people don't ex accept. Our uh, good election uh, results are only um, the result of us sticking to that idea. But ultimately, and we shouldn't forget this, your party scored 12.6% in the last election. I'm telling you that your poll standing now may be as high as 15%, but that is a very long way right. from becoming the biggest party in Germany. And if you are to do that, or to really gather political momentum, it seems to me you might have to consider changing some of your core messages and your style and your tone, particularly on issues concerning immigration, the German Muslim community, and reaching out in a way that you have refused and failed to do thus far to show that you're not a racist party. How are you going to do that? Well, I just do not recognize your uh, analysis here. We are not racist. This is just ridiculous. And it's really a completely false allegation, uh, even though it's being repeated all the time. Um, uh, we are not racist. No, Islam is not a race. So uh, being Islam critics uh, does not make oneself racist. This is just ridiculous. Uh, and we have nothing against foreigners, not at all. Uh, but we have something against illegal people in our country uh, who have no reason whatsoever. And this uh, is true in the very strict legal sense for 98 percent of those who have come since 2015. So in essence, um, to, to, to finish... So we, we have to change a little bit, you're yeah, right, and we have to also change the tone, we have to become more for professional. But uh, well, as I told, compared to 2013, when we were, in your words, were more or less a not so radical party, um, we have even gained, or the other parties, the major parties, the coalition parties, uh, have lost 20 percent in just four years. If you repeat that another four years, then uh, we ha do have a majority. Well, we'll, you, see, you, what, we'll see what happens there. You really think you no, and your I, party I, I, are Germany's I'm not future. predicting that. I'm not predicting that, no. But uh, that's what we're uh, working for. Peter Boehringer, thank you very much for being on Hard Talk. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you. It's much appreciated.